I'm getting old, you know. Steps, you don't have a handrail here, so I was concerned about that the whole service, saying, Lord, please help me not to fall <clears throat> going up the steps. Amen. Good morning. Great to see you. I look forward to this day. I, I don't know what's up with your pastor that he allows me to do this each year in his absence, but I hope he just doesn't ever have a, a reality check and change that. What are you doing over here? You don't sit over here. You sit. See, there's not even anybody in your seat. What in the world did you move? Are you okay? Everything all right? all right? Wow. That's not good when I've been here enough to where I know where everybody sits. <laughs> oh, man. I was just... I was just enjoying the service so much and the thought just kept coming back to me and coming back to me and coming back to me again and it is this thought why why do we only meet for an hour why do we do that I mean why don't we why don't we just have church all day some of you are going I, I used to like you but I don't anymore <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're worshiping God, and when you get in a service like this with such beautiful music and, and wonderful songs to sing and such a great song leader and a good announcer and good sound people and wonderful music and great instrumentalists and wonderful decoration, I've never preached from the jungle, <laughs> and this, this is pretty exciting. It's real exciting for me because I, I actually apply myself to some of this, like this especially over here. Now, I'm not really getting into the beaver part of it, but I'm getting into the beaver hut part of it. If you are a fisherman like me, that gets your attention right there because you know that's where the fish hang out, right? I mean, the huts look like this, but that's, it's all that structure that they have built, and my mind was going as I was sitting here. This is all structure, and then there's a drop-off right there. And the fish hang out under the drop-off, and I'd be fishing right there. And I'd be pulling those big northerners out from that, from that beaver hut right there. Who built that? Who's the beaver hut builder? Nice job. You did good. Amen. But there's something about this whole thing that's bothering me a little bit. I was, I was going to discipline myself to stay behind the pulpit, because some folks have told me that I need to not wander so much when I'm preaching here, because I end up halfway back, and you folks can't see me, and, and so on. So I thought, okay, I'm going to stay here. I hate snakes. <laughs> and they're everywhere in here. I mean, they're everywhere. There's one, two, three of them right here, right there. One of them's got his tongue out after me right now. I don't like that part. So if I wander, I'm getting away from the snakes, okay? Big snakes, little snakes. Big snakes. You know what the largest snake is? If you're going to look up the largest snake, how long do you think it is? It's 10 meters. That's like half the length of a bowling alley. No wonder I don't like them. I don't have anything to do with them. Amen. How about the smallest snake? I don't even like the smallest snake. The smallest snake is like um, 4.6 centimeters. Four, four, a little over 10 inches, or 4 inches, 4.5 inches. Can you imagine? I don't even like the small ones. I like any of them. And then we get happy over on this side. This is good. I want to come back for VBS just to see how you're going to use all this. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I had to say those things because every time Pastor Taylor gets up, he always starts his message with some interesting, unusual, unknown, you would have to look it up, facts to get your attention. And so I know probably when I asked what the longest snake is, he probably popped it right off when he's listening to this live stream. He probably said, oh, come on, you can do better than that, Mar Willie. So maybe next time, Brother Taylor, I'll come up with something better for you. <laughs> Amen. All right. <laughs> oh, me. Guess where I'm going this morning? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You say, why did you say guess? Because, oh, me. For those of you that take notes, I think I've preached from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 every time I've been here for the last 
five or six or seven or eight years. I don't know why the Lord won't let me get out of it when I come here, but for some reason, I tried this morning. I went to a, I went to a complete different message. I said, Lord, let me, let, me, let me go over to this one. He said, do that tonight. <laughs> I said, okay. Oh, me. You know, we might not be here in the auditorium all day, but it is his day. And I hope that you do focus on him. I do hope that you're able to eliminate normal weekly activity. Put those things aside. And whether you're in here or you're with your family around lunch or you're it's in the afternoon, it's 2 or 3 o'clock, and you're fighting, sleeping, taking a nap, <clears throat> go ahead and take that nap. And while you're in the process of going to sleep, be thinking on him. I think it's a wonderful thing to pray yourself to sleep. I do. I tell folks often, if it bothers you that when you pray, you, you, you go to sleep, you have to force yourself to stay awake. Well, there's ways that you can force yourself to stay awake, but I can't think of a better way to actually go to sleep at night than go to sleep talking to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Start the morning out recognizing your absolute dependence upon him by a simple statement like, Lord, I need you. Let it be the first words off your lips in the morning. As soon as you wake up and you're aware of what's going on and, and the day and so on, Lord, I, I need you. I don't, I don't want to go a moment throughout the day without knowing that I have his presence. Start it off with, Lord, I need you. Start it off with your complete dependence upon him and then doze off to sleep while you're praying to him. I, I can't think of a better beginning and a better conclusion of the day. And then especially on Sunday, as you're moving through whatever that you have planned for Sunday, I hope that you worship him all day. He's worthy of our worship. Amen? We don't have to have all the beautiful arrangement that you have in your service here to be able to worship him all day, although sometimes I think maybe we in our churches should do that. I think it'd be good. Maybe a little bit more often. Just plan a day. Next Sunday, we're going to be here all day. We've got all kinds of things planned. We've got all kinds of people to preach. We've got all kinds of music why not, just, why not just have an all-day service? Hmm. He's worthy. I'm afraid that we're moving farther and farther away from him a lot of times and some things that we do and not closer to him. But praise the Lord, you're in a place where you, you're, not, you're not wavering away from him. You're, you're striving to get closer and closer and closer, and it's obvious. It's obvious when you, when you drive in the parking lot. It's obvious that is a presence of the Lord. That's wonderful. Wonderful up, upgrade. A lot, lot of stuff. You, you folks are busy around here. Whoever's doing all the work and, and technology and all the work that's going on in the offices and uh, just new stuff. I, I just love coming here. Thank you so much for the privilege. Let's pray. Then we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. Let's bow in prayer, please. Our Father, as we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise, we thank you so much for the church house. Father, thank you for what it represents. Thank you that everybody in this building knows what it represents. And though there are many that will pass this building, even on the new road out front, it's just a building to them. Oh, it's called Berean Baptist Church, but that doesn't mean anything to them. They don't understand what's going on in this place. 
But Lord, I pray that as numbers of them pass this place, that by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, many of them would say, I, I just need to go find out. They'd find themselves leaving that road and pulling into this parking lot and experiencing all that this church has to offer them in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the place. Thank you for the family that you have assembled together. There's nothing quite like the church family. When one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. And Father, we thank you for a family that loves one another, cares for one another, interested deeply in one another's needs. And Lord, I pray you bless this family. Father, I pray for Pastor Taylor and his sweet wife. Lord, that's such a, such a difficult year physically that they've dealt with and you've blessed them and they're doing so well and we give you all the glory for that. Lord, might this not just be a time away, but might it really be a time of away and refreshment, strengthening their bodies, strengthening his mind, preparing him for what is to come with VBS and all the things ahead. Lord, I pray that you'd, you'd bless him. Thank you so much for him. Thank you for assigning him to this pulpit for this time. Father, would you please open our eyes in your word to behold wondrous things. Open our understanding that we won't just read the word, but we'll understand what it is that you have for us. We do pray if there's somebody here that's not saved that they would be today. Lord, there's people here that have needs represented that probably nobody knows anything about but them and you. Help them to know that you do know and you desire to grant them the desires of their heart. You desire to meet their needs. Lord, help them to know that there's a Savior who not just died for them and saved them, but loves them as one of his own and wants to be everything that he can be for them. Lord, help them to find their joy in you today. Father, because you first loved us, we love you too. And we pray by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Verse number one. <clears throat> Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves into every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also in Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto the death for Jesus' sake, but the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. 
for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our, in, our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What a chapter. What a book. I actually have been preparing probably one of the most unusual messages that you would ever hear a preacher preach. If the, if the Lord ever allows me to do it, I might do it first here, just to see how it, just to see how it would be received. You say, well, what is it that would make it so unusual? When a pastor stands up, or a preacher stands up, or an evangelist stands up to preach the precious word of God, where is the power? Is the power in the man, or is the power in the word? All of you would agree with me that the power is in the word. Is, what, is, is the most important thing that a preacher will ever say something when he is quoting the word of God, or something that he says out of his own intellect? Obviously, the Word of God. The power all rests in the Word, right? I've been studying, my personal study has been in Psalm 119. As you know, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the whole Bible, 176 verses. And what I'd like to do sometime in a message is just read Psalm 119. Do it in such a fashion that it would take a little while to read it, which it would anyway, for 176 verses. But in such a fashion that it would actually cause us to think on it as it's going. And when 176 is finished, say, let's pray and have an invitation. What would it be for a preacher just to read the Word of God? I'm thinking it would be pretty powerful. I mean, I'm told that Spurgeon, many times when he preached, he went on and on and on and just read Bible verses. The power that was represented in those Bible verses is then transferred into the pew as you're looking at the Word of God in your hand and, and digesting it as it's being read. What a powerful thought to just read the Bible. Let the Word of God do what we say that it can do, but actually believe it will do what we say that it will do, and that it would go right from the mouth of the preacher into the heart of the hearers and have a tremendous effect for the glory of God. Amen. But I'm not reading Psalm 119 this morning. I'm not even going through anything to do with the first 18 verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm not even doing a whole verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm actually doing a word. One word this morning, and it's in verse number one. So as you're looking at verse number one, I want you to guess. I'm not, don't do it out loud, but just in your mind right now, you're reading verse number one. What word would it be? You're looking at it, and you're saying, eh, I, I'm going to guess. If he's just doing one word for a whole message, let's see. What one do you think it would be? You don't have to say it out loud, just in your mind. Because probably 99% of you are completely wrong. You, you don't have it. Probably, probably the large majority of you would guess it's mercy. Because mercy would certainly be the word that we could preach on the longest and, and the one that we would relate to the most in there. Maybe it would be the word ministry. Because we talk a lot about ministry also. And, and it would be one that would be easy to build a whole message on regarding ministry. And maybe it's on faint not. Faint. Because older people are, are something that the world is pretty much eliminating in, in their thought process. And all of our, at least in the states, all the government side of it is trying to come up with the ways that they can to 
not even provide for the older folks anymore and just kind of get them out of the way because they're really, there's so many of them in this generation, they're just kind of a burden to society and so on. That's what, that's what the government says. And they'll find out as soon as all those older people of today are gone exactly how important those older people of today are in the society in which we live right now. There's always going to be older folks. But perhaps one of the largest generation of older folks is right now because of the baby boomers, right? And so we see that in our churches. We see the value of the older people in our churches and how important it is that we not just take it as a, a place for someone to sit in a pew when the older folks come in, but we in our churches love them. Amen. We love the older folks. We, we love what they stand for. We love how faithful that they are. We love that they have their seat in the pew, and woe to anybody that tries to sit in their seat in the pew. Amen. We love how they always have a Bible with them. We love how weather does not stop them from coming. We love old people in our churches. We love how they sing. We love how they pray. We love how they still find a place at an altar. We love older folks in our churches. Amen. I was thinking just the other day in regards to that, and I might have mentioned this to you one time before, I'm not sure, but it, the thought occurred to me that the older generation, the older folks in here, you are the last generation alive that actually understands the value of the written letter. Yeah. I mean, there's a generation coming up. If you just say letter to them, they go, what's that? I mean, they, they don't know. Children today do, do not know how to take a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen and say, dear sir, or Connie, or, or, or Shelley, or, or Bob, or whatever, and, and start a letter, and actually hand write a letter, fold it up into an envelope size. Envelope? They don't even know what an envelope is. Put it in an envelope, put an address on it, put your return address on it, and put a stamp on it and then take it to the mailbox and put up the flag and let the mailman come and get it. They don't know that. They don't have a clue. They know how to text. They definitely know how to do Instagram. They know how to tweet. They know how to do all the technology better than most everybody in this room. They know how to do that. And that is the world that's not only coming for them, that's being taught to them. I mean, so much to where you agree with me that in the school classrooms today, they're eliminating the art of teaching children how to write penmanship. It's not even in many of the classrooms today. Brother McLean uh, at Camp Yes hands out a questionnaire at the beginning of camp for the children to fill out just so he might have an a, a understanding of what it is that's going on that week that might help him in his in his presentation at the flagpole devotions and so on and on on that is just simple questions um, their name and have you been saved uh, have you been baptized have you have you joined your church what are five things that uh, you are involved in that you believe the Lord is very pleased with what are five things that you're involved with that you believe the Lord is not very pleased with what is something that maybe we could help you with at camp and, and they fill out those questions. They have, they have several minutes during one of the sessions to fill those out. And then when you look at those, the majority of them, you couldn't read one letter if you had to. I don't know how they even, maybe they don't. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they just kind of scribble because they don't know how to write. The majority of them in last, year's, last week's age, that's 13, 14, and 15-year-olds, I'm telling you, you wouldn't be able to read a sentence on most of them. Now, some of them were gifted, obviously homeschooled, obviously cared for by the parents, teaching them those things. You could tell the difference quickly. But man, how sad is that? How sad is that? that that's the generation that is coming up behind us that doesn't really care too much about the old folks. bothers me bothers me a lot and one of the ways that I think we can combat that is if you older folks in here don't just come in and sit down in your seat but invest yourself in a younger person 
Invest yourself in that younger person. Find a young person you can invest yourself into. Find a teenager that you can invest yourself into. Take some time. Take five minutes before a service starts. Just sit down next to them and tell them why you love this book. Tell them why you love this book and not necessarily just the book that's on this. Not against this. I'm not against technology. I'm not against it at all. I read the Bible technologically every day of my life. I did it today. I'm not against that at all. But it's never going to replace this. Especially it's not going to replace this in church. Especially not in church. You say, well, why not in church? Because I'm not as disciplined as you are. I don't have the discipline capabilities that many of you here have. You say, what do you mean? I, I can't. I can't have a screen in front of me with all the pop-ups that's going on, all the texts that, that kind of show up on the screen and the tweets and the Instagrams and all the things that, that just show up all the time. I, I, can't be, I can't be disciplined enough to not want to know what all that is while I'm reading the Word of God and listening to you preach. I, I can't do that. I don't have any of those distractions when I'm reading this. Amen? It's just me. It's just me. But I'm not preaching on fate not. <laughs> I'm not preaching on the old folks. The word I want to focus on is the second word. Therefore, seeing. I preached at Metropolitan Bible Baptist Church in Toronto last week. And I'd never been there before. And never been in the area before. Didn't really even know, didn't know what I was going into, didn't even know what to expect. A lot of people told me, prepare for a blessing because you're going to get a blessing at Metropolitan. I had a lot of people tell me that, and so I was prepared for it. But I didn't know what it was like to get into their, their Jerusalem, their area, if you will. So I got off, of the, off the highway, got off the 401, got, got off at the exits and so on, and started making my way to where their church was located. And when I was getting near by my GPS, when I was like a, a mile away or something, I started to notice something. And what I noticed is on the side of the roads, there was lots of young Filipino people that looked different than most of the people that are walking down the road. They looked different. And they were, they were happy, they were smiling, and they were talking with one, with one another, and and they had a, a zip in their step, and there was just something different about them. And after a while, I saw enough of them to where I thought, hmm, I wonder how many of these are at that church. I wonder how many of these are just, they're just on their way to church, and they're happy. And they look happy. And I thought to myself, if I, if I, if I was looking for a happy place to want to go to church or a happy place or something, I'd be, I'd be stopping one of these young people saying, hey, you, why are you so happy? Where are you headed? Praise the Lord. That's exciting. Uh, and they all had something else in common. Every one of them was carrying a Tim Horton. I thought, wow, what is going on with that? I mean, every one of them. And so I got there uh, quite a few minutes early, and I was just parking in the area of their church there, and sure enough, here they all come. They're, they're, all, they're all walking up the road, walking up to that place where they, where they assemble. They're all carrying their Tim. A couple of them were carrying a a carrier with six or eight Tims in it for the other people, I guess. I don't know. Or else they wanted a bunch. Anyway. Anyway, and come to find out what they're doing is, is they have their service, then they have a meal, and then all the people that want to go out and pass out tracks. They go out soul winning. And then after they're out passing out tracks and soul winning for a couple hours, they come back to the church and, and they fellowship for a while, and then they have another service, and then they, then they finally go home. They're, they're, they're basically involved in it all day. My eyes saw that, and what I saw is I saw young people happy in ministry. I saw people happy in ministry. I walked into church, and the church is, I said I'm not going to come off the platform, so I'm not. I'm going to stay here, okay? But kind of imagine me, um, I'm coming off. <laughs> I, I Imagine the church being so friendly that, oh, how you doing? You good? I mean, you can't, you can't walk past the people because, because they're, see, see that? They're friendly. See that smile? I mean, when people smile at you, it just, 
Yeah, see this? It just, it just makes you want to be friends with them, right? I mean, it just does. There's something about the smile. There's something about happy people that makes you want to be happy with them. And so I, I walked into that church, and as soon as I walked in that church, I'm sorry, I'm back, okay? As so, soon as I walked in that church, I thought to myself, I'm never going to make it to the platform. I'm never going to be able to get up there because I just want to talk to all these happy people. Happy people want to be with happy people. And I like to be a happy person, so I want to be with happy people. I saw the joy on their faces and the joy of why they want to be there. And it was just so contagious. Then I finally made it up to the platform, and Brother Romano came and started the service. And the other guy got up and made an announcement, and so he said, Brother Marwelli, we want to welcome you to the friendliest church in the world. I thought to myself, you are! <laughs> Amen! I mean, the friendliest one I've ever been to. Happy people ought to be God's people. We ought to be those people. But we have to work on that. That doesn't just happen. That happens because we work on the joy of the Lord in our life. Let me encourage you folks. Don't just come into church with all the long face and burdens represented therein of all the week that's gone on. Somehow check that stuff in the parking lot and come in here with the joy of the Lord. Amen? And if you see somebody that's kind of struggling with that, walk up to them with a happy face. You'll help them. You'll help them. You see, the reason I say all that is because it says, therefore seeing we have. It's important that other people see what we have. And it's important that what they see that we have is a good representation of the one who loves us so much. And we sing the joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, then let's let them see the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? Therefore, seeing, you see, the bottom line is, is we see things differently. We as Christians, we as Bible believers, we see things differently than the world does. Do you agree with me, church? We, we definitely see this different than most people out there do. We see it different than a lot of people that even have this in church with them. Because a lot of people have this in church with them, but they don't really know what is contained therein. It's just, you know, I, I, it's, it's my Bible. It was given to me by my grandma or my grandpa, so I'm certainly going to carry it with me to church. And, and that's, that's all the activity that Bible ever sees is when they pick it up and they go to church with it, and then they go back and they put it in the special place that grandma said put it, and there it collects dust all the rest of the week. We don't see this that way. Hello? We don't see this that way. We, we see this book as a living organism. The Bible is not just a book, it's a living book. Amen? It's a living book. And praise the Lord for the life that is therein. And we see this as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We see that it, gu it guides us where we are and it guides us into the future. We, we see this book as one that we want to hide its words in our heart that we might not sin against God. We see this book differently. We see it with respect. Amen. We see it with respect. We're not going to take this book and throw it down on the floor like we would another book, a novel, or whatever it might be. We're not going to do that. We're going to treat the book with respect. Amen? We're going to, we're going to those of you that really, really love the book like I'm talking about right now, you always know where it is. You don't misplace something that you really care about. You don't. You know how miserable you get when you misplace your telephone? It's like, honey, where's my phone? I mean, it's like you go into panic mode. Literally, you go into panic mode. I, I've got to know where that phone is. And so you say, call my phone. Hopefully I've got my volume turned up so it'll ring. I mean, we want to know where it is. Or when you leave the house and you forgot it, and you realize you forgot it, you're, you're halfway to work. You're late for work. You're turning around. You're going back to get the phone. I mean, I mean we want to have it with us all the time. 
I'm not saying that we want to have this physical book with us all the time, but we want to have what's therein as much as we can know with us all the time by hiding it in our heart that we might not sin against him. We, we love the book. We respect the book. We want to know where it is all the time, and we don't put it in careless places, and we don't leave it in careless places. I don't ever, I don't ever leave my Bible in the car. And I'm in the car all the time. All the time. You know I'm traveling all the time. I promise you, when I leave here tonight, when I go to my room tonight, my Bible's going to the room with me. It scares me to death to think about somebody breaking in my vehicle and stealing the Bible. Someone said to me, who in the world would steal a Bible? I don't know if anybody would, but I'm not taking the chance. Amen. I see the book differently than many, many, many people out there do, and you do too. Therefore, seeing this, we see it differently. Not only do we see the Bible differently, we see this, this, church. We see it different. You can watch a lot of church services online. A lot of church services you can see on, on YouTube. And we go... They call that church? I mean, it's dead. It's formalism. There's no life in it whatsoever. It's, 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 all, it's all habit up and down and up and down and up and down and proper form and proper things. And it's, whew. We don't see church like that. Right? We don't. Praise the Lord, we don't. We see church with some life. We like, to, we like to sing the hymns in the church with life. We like to listen to beautiful music presented in the church with life. We like to come and sit in the pews anticipating God to do something in our own heart. We do not want to leave the same way we came in. We want to be changed. Amen. We see things differently in church. We expect the preacher to preach. And we expect the preacher to preach on things that probably is going to really prick our hearts. We want that kind of preaching. Preacher, don't, don't, don't tiptoe around those things. It's most important that we get victories over. Slam us with those things. Amen? Let the Holy Spirit of God do a convicting work in my heart. We at church can't wait to make this. We can't wait to come to these places that we call the altars. We love this place. We love, we, we in our churches, we love the altar. The place where you leave that seat and you come, if for nothing else, you come just to worship God. We see, we see church differently than they do. We want it to be known differently than what they do. I think about this often. Think about yours. Think about this spot right here. Right now, there's however many people that's here. Tonight, there'll be however many people that's here. How many will be here tomorrow? How many will be here Tuesday? How many will be here Wednesday? Oh, Wednesday night, there'll be a few. A whole lot less than there is right now. How many will be here Thursday? Oh, and then it's Friday when everything's happening all over the place, but how many is here? How many is at the church on Friday? And then Saturday, how many is at the church? I've often thought the church, all the money that's put into the church and all the care that's, that's put into keeping it as beautiful as it is, and it's used so few times. I'm wondering if there's an answer to that. But Jerry, I wonder, wonder if there's something we can do. I, I don't know what it would be. But it kind of bothers me that the most important structure that we have in our life as Bible believers is empty so many hours a week there must be something that we can do to introduce the church to a neighborhood and to a community more than what we do we, we see the church differently we we see freedom way differently than many out there do thank god for our freedoms thank the lord for our freedoms to be able to pray publicly. Thank the Lord for our freedoms to stand and read the Word of God on the street corner if we want to. 
Praise the Lord for our rights, our freedoms that we have. We see it much differently. We see missions much differently than most. Listen, I, I'm not against humanitarian efforts. I'm really not against humanitarian efforts, unless it's the only effort that's put into reaching them. We can, we can clothe them, we can feed them, we can dig wells for them, we can introduce them to medical things that will help them physically. All those things are very, very important, but all those things are totally useless if we don't introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see missions differently than most. You see missions differently than many other even independent Baptist churches because you have a philosophy that you're building in missions. Your philosophy in missions is to go into all the world, not just part of it. You see, the average Baptist church today sends all their missionaries to 15% of all the world. If you go into the average Baptist church today and look at their missions display, wherever it is and however that they have it established, look at all of it and take every one of them off and, and put a thumbtack in the map, in the world map, where all the representation is, it's all going to be in 15% of the entire world's population. We see missions differently. We see missions into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen? We see death differently. We see death differently. We know absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? We see the fact of life and the facts of death. It bothers us when we go to a funeral of somebody that maybe we just knew and were just there out of respect, and whatever the preacher or so-called man or woman of God is that's standing up there trying to convince everybody here that this person is in heaven, and everybody out here knows that person's not in heaven. We see it very differently. We see death not as something that is a mournful time. I mean, it's absent from the body, it's present with the Lord. I mean, you know, yeah, sad for us to have to go through it, but happy for them, amen? Couldn't bring them back if you had to. Not only do we see death of the human differently, but you understand that this is a living organism? Church? Do you believe that? If you read your Bible, you do believe that. Church is a living organism. And I had a preacher come up to me one time down south, and he said to me, he said, you know what, Brent? He said, not only is church a living organism, but do you understand that everything that lives dies? I said, where are you going with that? He said, name me one church that you know of that's over 100 years old that still stands for the same things they stood for 50 years ago. I had to kind of do this. I had to go. I mean, I, mean, I, was, I was struggling to come up with one. I came up with some that was close. But then they completely went another way. He said, it's because the church is a living organism. He said, in fact, look at, look at and you, look at with me to Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, it says in verse number 2, Revelation 3, 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. It's a message to the Sardis church. He says, be watchful and strengthen. You see, we need to not just see those things differently, but we need to do our part to strengthen those things. Because every one of them that I mentioned to you, 
is dying quickly. We need to strengthen our families. As respectfully and as lovingly as I can say to you, if you have a mom and dad that's alive today and living together as husband and wife, you have a gift. And you need to do your part to strengthen that gift. We need to be strengthening our families. This week I'll go preach to, I don't know, 80, 90, 100, 10, 11, and 12 year olds. Do you know how many of those 10, 11, and 12 year olds will have mom and dad to go home to? Not many. They'll have a mom, maybe, or a dad, maybe, or a mom and mom, or a dad and dad. Be watchful. When I see that word watchful, you know, what that, you know what that word means to me? That word means to me that I said the church is a living organism. This is watchful to me. Protect it. Protect this. You need some people that will, that will stand guard and protect the pulpit will protect the Bible, will protect the church. We need some mom and dads that will, that will stand guard and, and protect their families. Dads that will bring their families together and, and hug one another as a family hug often and pray together often and love on one another often and, and verbalize love one to another often and, and protect and strengthen the families. I often think that, that we, we see the responsibility of the, of the dad to do a lot of those things, but when we, when, we th when we think about strengthening the family, how much more powerful it would be for children to do their part in strengthening the family. You know, it's a hard thing for a dad not to pray if the, if the child asks him to. Can you imagine the, the child coming to a mom or, or a dad before, before a meal and saying, oh, we just left camp and we always pray before a meal. Can we pray before our meals? Do you know how hard it would be for mom and dad to say, oh, we don't do that here. We're not thankful for our food. We... The children have a big part in strengthening the families just by their good recommendation and by their good living out that which what they learn from those that are doing it right. Be watchful. Church, church, we see things differently. And because we see things differently, what we see is so vastly changing right before our eyes. And we have to do our parts in the church, in the home, with the word, in the community, to do our part in strengthening those things which remain. We still have a lot of good. There still remains a lot of wonderful things in all those categories. But they're dying. And many of those are going to die right before our eyes. And we're going to wonder, what did I do to stop that from happening? What did I do to strengthen that which remains before it dies? Let's pray together, please.